Song of Solomon chapter 4. This is week 6 of a series we're calling Naked, and we are exposing God's plans for relationship, sex, and romance. And by the way, if you're a parent and you're wondering how to address these topics with your kids, um, Jen and I, just in a couple weeks, we'll give you more info about it next week, but Jen and I in a couple weeks are going to be leading a, a parent's class, you might say, a night for parents and we're calling it Coffee and Conversations. And we're just going to talk about how to have these conversations with the kids in your home, whatever age they are. If you plan to have kids, then come. Uh, even if they're not in your house right now. You, you'll hear all the details next weekend. But I just think this is so key that we talk about this. We have to talk about what our world is talking about. Everywhere you turn, somebody's got a take on these issues. Relationship, sex, and romance. Catch you up just real quick in Song of Solomon where we are. King Solomon is falling in love, has fallen in love with this girl that we know as Shulamite. Um, that's basically the female version of his name. So basically this book is about Mr. and Mrs. Solomon. She's the vine dresser in one of his vineyards. It's kind of this biblical Cinderella story. And uh, he's fallen in love with her. So they've gone through a bunch of different phases. And so we've gone from attracted to betrothed to last weekend married, and today disrobed, okay? It's the honeymoon night. It is the wedding chamber. It is everybody's left, and now it's the two of them on their wedding night. That's where we find ourselves. And, and why cover these topics on a Sunday? Well, for a lot of reasons, but mainly because it's something that affects all of us, and what's interesting is you can't really go anywhere without hearing about this, right? Like all you have to do is go to a bathroom stall or walk down the halls of a, a public school these days or in a college class or on the job at your workplace or, I don't know, in the grocery checkout line. You know what I'm talking about? The magazines, I mean, are you kidding me? I'm like hiding my kid's eyes. Like, why, right, I'm trying to buy eggs and almond milk. Could we not, you know? Like, is here the place for me to learn about that? So, like, like, like no joke, I wrote down some of the, uh, these are real topics from magazines. Uh, Life-changing relationships, guilt-free romance. Here's one, hot secrets to love that lasts. It's right there, like, I'm trying to buy a gallon of ice cream, and it's hot secrets to love that lasts, okay? Like, everywhere you turn, there's somebody who's trying to tell you their take on these topics. But it turns out that God already wrote an article on all of those topics, and he's got it all mapped out for us right here. And so I thought what we would do today is take one of the uh, headlines that you may see on one of these magazines in the checkout line, and we'll redeem it and place it as the sermon title for today's message. Would you humor me? Write these three words down. Ready? Best sex ever. We live in a culture that worships sex as God. But today I want you to understand that we can and should, in the confines of marriage, worship God through sex. God has given it as a gift to married couples within marriage as a way of honoring him. The Bible says in Hebrews 13, 4, that the marriage bed is undefiled. It's honorable. What happens in the marriage bed is an honorable, valuable thing in God's eyes. It's a gift. And so we're going to talk today about the best sex ever. And what does that look like? Well, I would say it's pure before marriage and it's passionate and pleasurable within marriage. And I'm going to argue today that married sex is the best sex because it's the way God designed sex to be between one man and one woman for the rest of their life. There's a reason we call it sex life. Not a one night stand, not passing yourself around to multiple partners. But listen, even if you failed, God can redeem it. You believe that? And if you don't believe it, you need to hear my story apparently because I'm so honored. I, I really, I'm so thankful that I get to be up here and speak into your life today. I was thanking God this week that God has taken a guy who's done it all the wrong way and God's redeemed me and changed my life. And now here I stand, hopefully helping some other people avoid the mistakes that I made 
back in the day. God is the redeemer. You believe that? He's the healer. He can take your failures. You've not gone too far. There's forgiveness in the name of Jesus. And so today we're going to talk about his love for us, our love for our spouses, and how this plays out in a marriage relationship. Now, God has wired us with a sexual appetite. Um, We talked about this earlier on in uh, the, the Song of Solomon in the book of Song of Solomon, and how God given, there's, there's a desire for you, uh, to, especially in the early days, to be drawn to someone else. And that's a God given desire, but it has to be exercised with caution. And so we're, we're going to be learning about that now, what it looks like to take those boundaries down and go within the confines of, of marriage and. You know, this couple has had boundaries up, but now they're married. And so the boundaries and their clothes come down. And this is a way within marriage for them to actually honor God. They've, we've, we've been built. God has wired us, hardwired us with a sexual appetite. And since we have that appetite, what I want you to see today, there's going to be lots of food and drink references all throughout Song of Solomon chapter 4. So speak in my language, actually. And so I want to help you see this today through that, through that lens. And I, I, I really believe that in many ways, God has designed sex within marriage to be an all-you-can-eat buffet. So follow along with me, Song of Solomon, chapter 4. Um, again, a little backstory. They've just gotten married in chapter 3. They're now alone for their first sexual encounter in chapter 4, verse 1. And Solomon, being the wise man that he is, is taking it slow. I'm warning you, this will get hot and heavy like it did that night for them. And uh, we we have a lot to learn from this. Um, He takes it slow, and he begins at her head, and, and he begins to just admire and compliment and notice everything as he goes down. So we're going to start with the appetizer. If this is an all-you-can-eat buffet, we're going to start with the appetizer. She's the eye candy, okay? Chapter 4, verse 1. This is Solomon speaking. Behold, you are beautiful, my love. Behold, you are beautiful. Your eyes are doves behind your veil. Which, by the way, them comparing each other and their eyes to doves, this is the only thing that they um, have a mutual comparison for. So, He will compare her eyes to doves. In the next chapter, she will compare his eyes to doves. What's the big deal? Well, doves are one of only a few mammals, uh, animals who mate for life. They choose one mate, and they are with that mate for the rest of their lives. So this is an interesting correlation, connection that they're making, understanding that I've got eyes only for you, and your eyes are only for me. Your eyes are doves behind your veil. Your hair is like a flock of goats. Leaping down the slopes of Gilead. Now, men, before you try this tonight, let me explain the connection. Back in, the, back in their day, when you would see a, uh, a hillside, a herd of goats, a flock of goats coming down the hillside, the goats in the area were typically black-haired goats. And they would be sometimes in hundreds or thousands in a flock. And as they came bounding down the hillside, it made the the hillside appear like it was alive. So what he's describing here is an image that immediately connected when he said it. And he's probably describing that her hair is black and curly and just tumbling over her shoulders. Verse 2, your teeth are like a flock of shorn ewes that have come up from the washing all of which bear twins, and not one among them has lost its young. He goes, not only are your teeth white, but you have all of them. That's hot, right? That's hot. Woo! So we don't know where she's from, but we know obviously if she has all her teeth, she must not be from Arkansas. So, okay, verse 3. I'm sorry. Verse (laughs) 3. Your lips are like a scarlet thread, and your mouth is lovely. Your cheeks are like halves of a pomegranate behind your veil. Your neck is like the Tower of David. 
So he's saying it's, it's slender. It's, I, I'm noticing it. It's built in rows of stone. On it hang a thousand shields, all of them shields of warriors. She must be wearing a necklace that she wore that night for her wedding. Verse 5, your two breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle that graze among the lilies. He's describing not only what she looks like, the, the lilies, some people believe are maybe some sort of lacy lingerie that she's wearing, but he's describing what he's looking at as he's, he's, he's describing her from her head down, and he gets to her breasts, and he says they are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle. Now think about this. This is, uh, he's saying they're twins, so they're symmetrical, and he's saying that What's a gazelle? What's a, what's a fawn? They are soft. And if you were approached by two twins of a, of a gazelle, what would you want to do? Pet them, most likely. <laughs> I'm just, I think it's not a far stretch to say, not only do they look good, but I can't wait to touch them, I believe is what he's saying. <laughs> and apparently, according to verse 6, he's got all day, all night, because he says, until the day breathes... And the shadows flee, I will go away to the mountain of myrrh and to the hill of frankincense. You are altogether beautiful, my love. There is no flaw in you. Come with me from Lebanon, my bride. Come with me from Lebanon. Depart from the peak of Amana, from the peak of Sinir and Hermon, from the dens of lions and from the mountains of leopards. You have captivated my heart, my sister, my bride. You have captivated my heart with one glance of your eyes, with one jewel of your necklace. He goes, my heart is pounding. You are flawless, he tells her. As they have this first of many more sexual encounters on their, on their wedding night. Now, he's a wise man because he's taking this slowly. Um, it's been said that men are more like microwaves ready in an instant and a woman is more like a crock pot she needs some some time to simmer right and he understands something that a lot of men need to understand that some of the most sexual organs of a woman are her heart and her brain being connected emotionally in the moment this is so much more see this is so much more than just sex the act of sex is easy anybody can have sex but it's intimacy that we're after being known and fully known knowing someone and being fully known by them that's intimacy and that's what we're after this is so much more than just an appetizer of some eye candy this is him slowly inviting her into this process um, one of the books we've been advertising that we have for sale on our website uh, awaken.church slash naked is this book called Sheet Music by Dr. Kevin Lehman. One thing he talks about in this book is that sex should be what he calls ASAP, A-S-A-P. And all the men in the house are like, amen. Now, let me explain the acronym. His acronym means ASAP as slow as possible. And this is what Solomon is exemplifying here because he's inviting her in to this emotional experience. It's so much more than just he's after her body. That's, that's not the case here. And so as we, as we just thumb through these, these verses and look at what's happening, he's slowly working down her body. He, in verse 6, he, he makes it clear there's no rush. He's, he's got all night. He's excited about this, this, this opportunity. They have time. Chapter 1, you might remember the first time we met Shulamite, she was apologizing for the way she looked. You might remember that. She didn't like the, the darkness of her skin. But what I find amazing is that by the time we get to their wedding night and she's standing mostly undressed before him, he says to her in chapter 4, verse 7, you are altogether beautiful, my love. There is no flaw in you. Not one flaw. Now, that honestly can't fully be said of any human. Every human has flaws, scars and birthmarks and stretch marks and tan lines and the older we get, the more of them there are. And so the reality is, like, how could he actually honestly look at her and say that there is no flaw? Well, think about it like this. Fashion today often involves paying a little bit more for some shredded denim or some shredded fabric. Or that shirt came with, like, stuff hanging off the side of it. Or 
If you walk past American Eagle right now in the mall, you'll see their campaign right now that says, ripped, repaired, yours. The idea is like, you're going to pay more because we, we, we shredded your jeans for you, you know? And sometimes we'll, we'll actually be willing to pay a little bit more for something that makes the clothes a little unique. We need to learn within marriage to admire and actually learn to be thankful for the things that make our spouse unique. Don't, you, don't view them as flaws. Now, there, all of us have flaws, but Solomon says, I don't see a single flaw. You are flawless in everything that I'm looking for. Your scars, the things that make you unique, the color of your skin, they're just what makes you you. So why could Solomon say there is no flaw? Well, not because she didn't actually have a flaw, but here's why. Because she belonged to him. Flawless. Husbands, let your wife be the standard of female beauty. Wives, look at your husband as the standard by which all other men are judged. He is it. She is it for you. I wrote in my Bible, my wife is the standard. There is no flaw. Verse 8, he says, come with me multiple times. Come with me from Lebanon. He's not actually inviting her to leave. Uh, we don't believe that she actually lived by dens of lions and mountains of leopards and the peaks of mountains. But more likely, this is a poetic representation of leaving her fears behind and joining him on a journey of intimacy. Solomon rightly understands that on the wedding night, this is a very emotional time for her especially, but really for both of them. And he invites him, he invites her to join him on this journey of intimacy. And by verse nine, he says, you've captivated my heart. Twice he says this, he goes, my heart is pounding. The blood is pumping. I'm so excited to be with you here in this moment. Now we're just getting started. This is the appetizer, the eye candy. Now we move on to the main course. It's the milk and honey. Write that down. The main course is the milk and honey. Verse 10. How beautiful is your love, is your love, my sister, my bride. How much better is your love than wine and the fragrance of your oils than any spice. Your lips drip nectar, my bride. Honey and milk are under your tongue. The fragrance of your garments is like the fragrance of Lebanon. A garden locked is my sister, my bride. A, a spring locked, a fountain sealed. Your shoots are an orchard of pomegranates with choicest fruits, henna with nard, nard and saffron, calamus and cinnamon with all trees of frankincense, myrrh and aloes with all choice spices, a garden fountain, a well of living water and flowing streams from Lebanon. So he's using, he's choosing his words wisely and he's making associations with her that she immediately connects in, in positive ways. For instance, as they begin touching and kissing, now this is more than just him looking. They're obviously kissing here. He, how do I know that? Well, because he mentions the taste of her lips and the taste of her tongue. Obviously, this is more than just a peck on the cheek that's happening in this, in this honeymoon suite. And he says in verse 11 that honey and milk are under your tongue. You got to understand that milk and honey was an immediate connection back in their day to the land that they were living in. Let me give you a quick backstory. Back in the day when God was, was preparing to take his people, the Israelites, into the land that he called the promised land. It was the land of Canaan. As he promised this land to his people, he told them this is, this is the land of that's flowing with milk and honey. So in their day, when you talked about a land that's flowing with milk, it means that there's, it's, it's lush and it produces life and grass and, and enough for animals to grow and reproduce. And it's a, it's a place of everything that you would need. That's a land flowing with milk. Honey back in their day was the sweetest thing that they'd ever tasted. So when he says there's a land flowing with milk and honey, he says, I'm going to give you a place where you can make your home that is everything you need and want. So does this make now, uh, does this shed new light on what he's saying? You're, you're, the, 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 the bottom of your tongue, underneath your tongue, tastes like milk and honey. He goes, just like our land that we're living in. 
is a God-given gift where I am at home and it's everything that I need and want. You now, my bride, I am at home. You are a God-given gift to me and you are all that I need and want. Which, by the way, should be the goal of, uh, goal of yours within your marriage. To be everything, to be your spouse's promised land. Everything that they need, everything that they want, meeting their needs, meeting their desires, there to, to nourish and to cherish. And so he begins not only saying that, that God is, she is a God-given gift to him, but now he begins to praise her for protecting her virginity and her, her sexuality. Do you notice in verse 12, he says, you are a garden locked, a spring locked, a fountain sealed. She saved herself sexually for him. She has decided early on that when there would be advances from young men, that she was going to say no until marriage. This is something that is not done or guarded nearly enough in our day any longer. This is an important thing for her. Guys and girls, listen. She is an example of someone who's done this right. And listen, when our culture mocks virginity, we're going to do our best, church, to redeem that title. And we're honoring God as a badge of honor. We're going to choose to honor God. We're going to choose to honor our future spouse. You may not even know who they are just yet. But you can and you should make a decision today to say, no, my garden is locked. My spring is locked. My fountain is sealed. When he talks about that, that she was locked, it doesn't mean nobody can get in. It just means she had the key and would only give it to one person. This is the night where the ownership is transferred. And she, she's in the process of handing the key of her locked garden over to him. What an honorable thing. Now, again, that doesn't mean if you failed, there can be no celebration and you might as well just throw it to the wind. No, make a decision today. From this point forward, I'm going to honor God with the way that I live. I'm going to save myself for this future encounter that I will have with my husband or with my wife. I'm going to be, from this day forward, a garden locked and a fountain sealed. I will only give myself to that man or to that woman when that day comes. And he's starting to understand in verse 13 and 14 that in this locked garden is the choicest of fruits and choice spices he goes, it's the best of the best. Why? Because God's way is always the best way. Because God knew what he was doing. Because God knew why it was that he would lead them to say multiple times, do not stir up or awaken love until it pleases. Now is the time to stir it up and awaken it. And he's coming into this garden, this, this locked garden and a fountain sealed, and he's understanding that the best things are there. God is saved. Listen, God, our, our God is a loving father who is delighted by our delight. And he has saved the best of the best if you're, if you're willing to trust him. If you're willing to do things his way. So he says in verse 15 that she's a garden fountain, a well of living water, and flowing streams from Lebanon. He, he, he says, you are my God-given gift to quench this thirst that I have. He would write about this also in Proverbs chapter 5. Proverbs 5 verse 18 and 19 say it this way. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice, rejoice in the wife of your youth. A lovely deer, a graceful doe. Let her breasts fill you at all times with delight and be intoxicated always in her love. He goes, I am intoxicated by you. I am drunk at what I am looking at and touching and kissing. He, he, he already told us in verse 9, you've captivated my heart. My heart is pounding. This is, you are flawless. Thank you, he's saying. This is his way of saying, thank you for guarding yourself. Thank you that tonight I get the key to the garden that you protected up until this point. And by the way, sometimes we say the phrase, pure until marriage. Listen, it's pure through marriage. This is pure. You're like, but they're having sex. That's pure. 
within this context. God is honored in this context. They've done this God's way. God is honored by that. We'll see that um, exemplified here in just, uh, just a moment. So we've got the appetizer and we've got the main course. Now, I don't know if you guys have been to a restaurant before that's presented the appetizer and the main course in this amazingly beautiful way. It's like a work of art when they bring it to the table and you're like, that's incredible. I'm excited to taste it, but I kind of want to just look at it right now. You know, it's kind of a work of art. Well, it would be a bummer if you just let it sit on the table and never touched it, right? At some point, you got to grab a fork and a knife and dig in. Time to dig in, okay? Number three, here's, here's another thing we note from here. This is our third course, if you will. Eat, drink, and be merry. Verse 16, chapter 4. This is most likely her speaking. Awake, north wind. And come, O south wind, blow upon my garden and let its spices flow. Let my beloved come to his garden and eat its choicest fruits. We've been walking through this, this, the, the whole chapter so far has basically been foreplay and him describing and appreciating what he's seeing, what he's looking at, now what he's touching, what he's kissing, and now this foreplay has her ready to play. He, she's inviting him in. And I, I love this exchange right here in verse 16, because if this is her speaking both times, the first part in verse 16 says, blow upon my garden, she says. But at the end of verse 16, she says, let my beloved come to his garden. You see the exchange that's taken place? I've guarded I've locked up my garden, but tonight, Solomon, I hand you the key. This is now, I am now your garden. This is the exchange that God has desired for us, wired us to have on our wedding night. So eat, drink, and be merry. Now, between chapter 4, verse 16, and chapter 5, verse 1, if we could put emojis in the Bible, it would be like the little flame emojis, you know what I'm talking about? Like... That's like the hottest part of scripture right there, and it's, we, we can't even read about it. It's almost like the curtain's closed, and we know what's happening, and this is such an intimate moment that only the two of them will encounter, and it's not even ever written about on the pages of scripture. Just the before, and then chapter 5, verse 1, the after. It's almost like Solomon's head hits the pillow He's excited. He's out of breath. Chapter 5, verse 1. I came to my garden, my sister, my bride. I gathered my myrrh with my spice. I ate my honeycomb with my honey. I drank my wine with my, will, my milk. He goes, all of the patience and the time and the resisting temptation and the investment we've made into this relationship, it was all worth it. It was all worth it. This is his moment. They're, they're, they're laying back on the bed together maybe and He's just so thankful for this, this interaction that they've had and that this is actually an honoring thing to God. And how do we know God's honored by this? Well, interestingly, the end of chapter 5, verse 1, there's a third voice in the room. And this voice says, eat, friends, drink, and be drunk with love. Whose voice would this be? Besides the ultimate songwriter, God himself, their father, our heavenly father saying, I am delighted by your delight. And what I find really interesting about this is that there are three imperatives in this one half verse, eat, drink, and be drunk. God says, that was fun. Keep it up. There's much more to come. He commands it. In fact. He commands it. These are three imperatives. Eat, drink, and be drunk. You will not find another verse in the Bible where God commands you to get drunk, okay? <laughs> All of the rest, it's like, uh, don't get drunk. Steer clear. It's dangerous. Proverbs writes about the danger of getting drunk and constantly needing another drink. God right here in their wedding suite says, eat, drink, and get drunk. Remember Proverbs 5 verse 19, always be intoxicated with your love for, for your spouse. This is the place where God demands, God commands that they get drunk on their love for one another. And that's exactly what's happened. I hope today to lift up the gift of sex within marriage. 
and understand that it is not a dirty thing like our culture has made it out to be. See, the devil has taken something that God designed for good to use for us. That's, what, that's the way God built it. And the devil has taken it and made, made it dirty and he's using it as a weapon against us. And we have to redeem that. This is the way that God designed it to be. I hope if I could, if, if I could help you understand and think through the gift of sex, you would start to understand the value and the beauty of it that, it that it has within marriage. Now, as foreign as this sounds, to have God's voice speaking on the wedding night, like, God, give us some space. Listen, God's not a prude. He's delighted by this. He built us. He wired us for pleasure. And when we do things his way, he's honored by it. I wonder what it would do, husbands and wives, to your sex life if you started inviting God's voice into into it. Inviting God's voice into your bedroom. Inviting God's voice into your intimacy with with your spouse. I'm telling you, it'll change everything. It'll give you a new perspective. It'll give you a desire to pleasure and and serve your spouse. It'll bring you closer together with God and with him or her. So pure sex, married sex, is the way that God designed it to be. It's married sex is the best sex because that's how God designed it. Now, I know that when it comes to the topic of um, a newlywed couple that I, I don't have to do any convincing, like you just wait, you really should have sex with your new married partner. I know that I don't need to convince you to do that. That's it. right now. It's really hard not to before you get married. Um, some of you, you're, you're engaged right now and you've already prayed the fiance prayer about when Jesus is coming back. You know what I'm talking about? Like, Hey Jesus, I know the whole thing about like you coming back any day now but we're getting married in two weeks. Do you think it could be like two weeks and a day before you come back? You know, like got some things to take care of if you know what I'm talking about, right? Like I don't need to, to beg you to be sexual with your, your newlywed spouse. I understand that. But, but listen, let me just, some real talk about sex within marriage. Um, we're, we're all about real talk here at Awaken. That's why I'm preaching this, this part of scripture. That's one of the most challenging to preach. Um, We're all about real talk. And I want you to understand this, that married sex, what I'm trying to tell you today, married sex is the best sex because it's the right sex. However, just because it's the best sex doesn't mean sex in marriage is the best every time. Let's have a realistic look at what this will be like when you get married. Because if you're watching it in a movie, which you should steer clear of, but when you watch it in a movie, it is depicted in a much different way than it often plays out within marriage. Like I said at the beginning, there's a reason that we call it sex life, not sex month, not sex week, not sex one night stand, sex life. You are designed to be with one person sexually for the rest of your life, your married husband or wife, and you now have a lifetime to build on this first encounter. Honor God in that and through that. Developing sex takes a lifetime. Um, I was talking to Jen about this message this week and I, I walked through it all with her and she said, how, how do you tie that back to the gospel now? <laughs> and, and I told her, it's actually easier than you might think. God is the ultimate lover. And in an, a, a, a non-sexual way, I want you to understand that God is deeply, passionately in love with you. We've just witnessed in Song of Solomon chapter 4 the most intimate act of a love display that a couple can ever have. 2,000 years ago, God gave us the most intimate and yet public display of love that we could ever imagine. God, the Father, sent his son. Jesus spilled his blood publicly on a tree for you and for me. For rebellious sinners, for people that didn't deserve his love, that don't deserve forgiveness for people who are running from him before you cared about Jesus. He had already shed his blood for you. You believe that man? That's love right there. 
You want to talk about the gospel. Listen, the most important thing that you understand today is not about sex. It's about God's love for you. And I hope that what you would understand today is that intimacy is what God is after with you. He wants you to know him and he wants to be known by you. He wants a relationship with you. He wants to draw you in. And I hope you also see that we serve a a loving father who who desires to give his kids good gifts. And he has our best in mind. Let's not let our culture taint the way we see our loving God. And let's not let our culture degrade the gift of sex within marriage that God has given us. Our culture worships sex as God. I hope you've seen today that we can worship God through our sexuality as we honor God before marriage by abstaining and honor God within marriage by indulging.